Hi, I'm Dylan, and you're listening to the Animals at Home podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan. Thank you so much for joining me. If you are new to the show, thank you very much for tuning in this week. I do really appreciate it. And of course, I appreciate all my regular listeners. Uh, The show is growing and uh, I can only thank you guys for this. So thank you so much for listening. If you're enjoying the show and you're wondering how you can help the show out, there's a couple very simple things you can do. One, you can go rate the show on iTunes or podcasting app on your Apple device. Two, subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on iTunes. And three, share it. Share it with everybody you know, or maybe not the non-reptile people because they might not appreciate that at all. But share it with all your reptile friends and groups on Facebook. That is really the best way to grow the show. And, And so far, you guys have been doing a fantastic job with that. And I really, really appreciate it. So as I mentioned in a previous episode, at the end of September, there is going to be an amazing conference being put on by Advancing Herpetological Husbandry in Rodeo, New Mexico. The conference runs September 27th and 28th. It looks like it's going to be an incredible time. There's some really big headlining speakers that there's going to be just a ton of information to be learned. Sam Parrott, who's one of the organizers, sent me this quick preview clip to show you guys. So I'm going to let that play right now. Doesn't that look incredible? If you're able to make it out, definitely consider it. Myself, I'm going to really try to make it out. My September schedule is always a little bit crazy. I never know exactly what's going on until I get closer to that date. So I'm going to try my best. Coming from Canada makes things a little bit more tricky, although I don't really have much of an excuse because a ton of the advancing herpetological team comes from the UK. So I can't really make Canada as an excuse. So again, I'll try my best, but uh, definitely consider taking a look. That looks like it's going to be great. And actually, a future episode will feature Sam Parrott. So he's going to tell us a little bit more about it then. This week on the podcast, I'm talking to Ryan McVeigh. So you may know Ryan as the brand manager of Zilla, but really he is much more than that. He wears so many different hats in the hobby. And this episode is just full of ways that individual hobbyists can take on the responsibility of making the hobby better. There are so many different ways you can do that. And Ryan really gives many different examples of how it can be done specifically what I think this conversation will be. Part of it is really enjoyable learning about how he uses his engineering background to help de- design and develop Zilla products. But even more than that, I think where this the, the meat and potatoes of this episode and the value of this episode is going to come in from when where Ryan discusses how he created one of the best functioning herpetological societies in probably North America, definitely the United States, and I'm sure Canada as well. He has a a very well-functioning society, herpetological society, that is just doing amazing things. He tells us how he has used the herpetological society to help, you know, remove or reverse laws that have been trying to be put in place to ban reptiles. He talks about the, the methods they use to get kids involved and all sorts of really interesting things. So if you are part of a herpetological society or you want to start one, this is an episode you absolutely need to listen to. And the other piece of the hobby that we talked about that is, is something that quite often gets attempted but quite often fails is reptile rescues. And Ryan's partner, Erica, is someone who has one of the best functioning reptile rescues in the country. And he talks about that and what makes it successful and some of the pitfalls you can watch out for. So Ryan is a big picture guy. And when you listen to him speak, it you can just tell he's somebody that likes to step back and really make this. He's really attacking the hobby from all these different angles. And he's trying to make the the hobby a well-oiled machine. And it's very evident when you listen to him speak. So without anything further, here's my conversation with Ryan. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. Well, I think you, I can officially classify you as a unicorn in the hobby. And I mean that in the coolest way. (laughs) I am pretty beautiful, so. That's uh, true, yeah. So it has two meanings here. (laughs) I don't think anybody wears, or there's not too many people that wear as many hats as you do in the hobby. So I think we can learn a ton from someone like yourself. And we're going to jump into all that. Um, Do you remember the moment where you became fascinated with reptiles? I don't remember the exact moment. I've always been fascinated with reptiles, but one my early, one of my earliest memories was, I think I was four. 
And we were at a family reunion at like a park and some barn or something where we had a picnic. And there was a pond and all the little uh, toadlets were morphing out. So there's millions of baby toadlets everywhere. And as soon as I realized that, I ran back to the party, grabbed a whole bunch of Dixie cups and filled them with hundreds of toadlets. <laughs> and then like sat on the ground and just covered myself in like baby toads. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> That's one of my earliest memories. But I've always That's had... Awesome a salamander that I caught or a garter snake or something, you know? Do you have, does your uh, passion extend to other animals as well? Or are you just mostly a reptile person? I I've done a lot with fish. I used to breed discus. I've kept my, like stingrays and, and a bunch of freshwater barracudas, cichlids, things like that. And then in college, um, you know, it got a lot more difficult as it moved around a lot right at the end of school to, to, to move giant aquariums. Uh, and I realized I'd always loved reptiles. And I always, I've always had one, but never many. I always just kind of had one until then, one or two. Um, and I realized if I filled them up, if I drained all the water and filled them with reptiles, then they were way lighter to carry, <laughs> and way easier to move. Yeah. Um, and then I worked at a pet store when I was in college. It kind of gave me some connections. I started going to reptile shows and then just, I went from like one snake to 80 reptiles in one year. Oh yes. The classic uh, expansion. <laughs> yeah. Jam broke open and I just could not find enough cool species to play with. Yeah. Well, I, I actually was into fish as well and I had the similar experience. I remember I had to move once and moving my fish tanks was just the worst thing in the world. And it was just, Absolutely. even caring for fish is an amazing, like create quite a bit of work, you know, just maintaining oh, yeah. them. Water changes, chasing algae, trying to get everything like pH balances all right. I mean, I loved it. I still have a couple fish tanks at home. I, at one point I got fish and then I was like, now nah, I'm done. So I got uh, an elephant trunk snake to take care of the fish. <laughs> and I just got him. Um, but I have, I have a marine aquarium, a small little bio cube at home. And, you know, I like toying with it. I, 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 I still appreciate and love fish, but reptiles have always been like a huge passion. It was just fish were more readily available and something I got interested in as well. Do you know where that passion for reptiles come from? Like what sparks it in you to love them so much? Uh, I don't know. And uh, my dad absolutely is petrified of reptiles. So it didn't come from him. My mom was never, she was never a big reptile person. So it didn't come from her. Um, I don't know. I've, I've just always been fascinated with them. And the more I get, I've gotten into them, the more I love learning. I mean, you go into, our, you know, me and uh, my girlfriend, Erica, we go, go into our bathroom and our bathroom reading materials, scientific articles that we send each other and think are cool. You know, so we just nerd out about the, the craziest stuff just because it's fun. To, and that's the fun part is learning more about it, not just keeping them. I love the animals interacting with them, but I almost get more excitement out of educating other people and then learning more. Well, I mean, and that's exactly the same with me. Like that is the fun part of the hobby, just, just progressing it and progressing your knowledge base. So education wise, did, you didn't go to school for any biology or anything, right? Not even close. Um, this has always been a hobby for me. Something I've been passionate about on the side. And I, in high school, I realized I, I, I mean, I grew up wanting to be a veterinarian and a zoologist and a biologist. Uh, and I, I watched a lot of people live their, their hobby and their dream and, I, and, and, see, and watched it turn into work and become stressful and be a job and then no longer be fun. And it scared me. And I, my grandpa was a, an architect uh, and built homes. He built like, he's built Frank Lloyd Wright houses. I mean, and I, I, was always, I was on job sites with him when I was a kid, just working on stuff. And I always loved buildings too. So I went down the path of architectural engineering, um, ended up getting a master's from Milwaukee School of Engineering in uh, environmental engineering, groundwater remediation, and wastewater treatment plant design. So that was something else that interests me with, the, with being able to improve environment, uh, environmental spills and things like that. And then um, I just kind of kept this as a hobby. So it was always fun and it was something I was always excited to come home and, and, and interact with. Um, and uh, yeah, so I have, a I have a master's in engineering nothing to do with reptiles and it's always just been something that i've been excited about so how did that transition happen from from working in the architecture and engineering to i mean now you work at zilla so you, you made that you did make the jump at some point yeah that was an interesting one um so i got out of college i, I worked for a couple different places I, i'd done internal inside sales for an hvac company i was doing building commissioning work where i was going in and, and checking out building systems and things like that and uh and I liked the job and I, I started the Herp Society. I became involved with US Arc. I'm the Wisconsin representative for US Arc and have been since like 2014, 2013. Um, 
which uh, there is no other state representatives. I was like the model we were going to start this going and then it never went anywhere. So I'm the only one. Wow. Um, <laughs> but it, and I, I built a reputation uh, working with USR and fighting laws, um, building the Madison Area Herbological Society, which has been one of the more well-known herb societies in the country and, uh, and easily one of the most active. And um, I, I worked with people who works at Central Aquatics, which is the parent company for Zilla. And they called me up one day and they're like, hey, Zilla needs a reptile guy. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, that, that's not a job description. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to, do you want me to come scoop poop? I mean, I don't yeah. know what I'm doing there. So I had a good job and I said, you know, I, I have a house, I have family, I can't just leave and go scoop reptile poop. It'll be food. cool, but I don't think I can do it. And I kept getting calls. And eventually, uh, Zilla at one point had sponsored us because of my connection with those people and sponsored the Herb Society. And the head of HR sent me an email and said, hey, here's a job description. I know you're not interested, but do you know anybody? That was the first time I actually seen a job description. So I kind of looked into what a marketing brand manager was a little bit more. And I sent her an email. I said, look, now that I actually know what this is, not just a reptile guy, um, let's talk. And I sent her my resume. We, I came in and talked and got hired pretty much right away. So, so what is the day-to-day job that you have? Everything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Everything that has to do with the Zilla brand, I have my hands in. Gotcha. Um, technically, my... my um, Title is marketing brand manager, but I do I work I, I lead a lot of the project development and how that's going with our R and D guys. They manage the projects, but I am putting in and, and guiding that that throughout the entire process. Um, I do all the packaging. I do uh, even the ads you see in like Reptiles Magazine. I'm in charge of of getting that together. I have creative people that design it, but I'm the one that signs off on all of it. Every um, donation we do goes through me. Every thing that has the Zilla logo on it goes through me at one point. So the million dollar question is, does it feel like work or is this a dream job? Uh, both, if both? you follow me on Facebook, it's a dream job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you hang out with me for a day, it's exhausting and extremely stressful. <laughs> um, I love what I do though. And, and it, it's the really cool part of it for me is, is not, I don't need a title or I don't need to be the you know, Zilla it's more, I'm now in a position to make impacts on the hobby that are nationwide and, and big. I can create products that really make a difference for the husbandry of the way people keep animals. The success of every little Timmy or Ryan out there that wants to keep an animal now can be more successful based on how I develop these products for them. Um, and then just how the hobby goes in general, donations to US Art, supporting conservation. There's it's put me in a position to have a very big reach on, on a hobby that I'm so passionate about. Are, are there certain products that you help develop that you are just the most excited about? I'm sure you've developed tons, but is there anything that sticks out? Um, some of the stuff that I've... Some, uh, recently, there's been a, I've I launched a lot of decor in the last couple of years, and it's different. I, I don't like the idea. There's a lot of Me Too products out there where... Zoomed has a filter, so Exoterra makes a filter. And they do this tank, so they do this tank. And it's just... Skyscraper terrarium is one. Zuma did it. Exoterra did it. Everybody just paladariums. One did it. The other one did it. I'm not about that. I it, I don't think there's a need for it. And if somebody else already did it, then I don't think I need to do it too. Unless there's a strategic reason to, for me to do it. Um, but everything that I create, I want if it, if it's going to be something that exists, it's got to be better. It's got to be. We really got to think about how we engineer it. And that engineering background I have really does help me kind of think outside the box and how we design this stuff. Um, the rock layers that we came out with, it's just a humid hide, but it's developed in a way that it holds humidity longer. It gets better airflow. It creates a better hide for the animal. Um, humid hides have a hole in the top. You basically made a skylight and a chimney for all the humidity to get out and the light to get in. doesn't really help your animal. It doesn't make them feel safe. Right. So I put the entrance at the side. It ramps up inside of it and around the corner. So they have a dark hiding hole like you'd want them to have. The top being solid creates a convection, like kind of a circulation of air and humidity, and it stays humid a lot longer. Um, the, the spring cave is another one we just came out with that uh, it dri- it's an internal waterfall almost inside of a cave, and the water drips down leaves. So inside there, it's dripping down leaves, so chameleons will drink out of it. Tree frogs live in there like an internal rain chamber. It provides humidity and good drinking water. There's no holes in the outside of it, so your animal can get up in there and you can't get them out. Um, and crickets don't die in the reservoir and make it just a cesspool. Um, you know, so it's things like that. Even the, even the front opening terrariums that we've launched, I took a look at my competitors and what I've used in the past and reached out to a bunch of reptile keepers. Having the herb society is nice because I just post like, 
what do you like and not like? And everybody gets entered to win whatever I grab out of the warehouse and give you, you know? So I get a lot of input that way and, and things that people come to and f- frustrations they find in products. And, and I can take a look at that. And like the front opening programs that we launched changed a lot of that. They, their doors are removable. So you can take them out and clean them and put them back. If they break, you don't have to like rip silicone out. You can just pop it off and put it back in. Um, it comes with clear plastic inserts for the top to hold humidity. So first thing I do is saran wrap the top of them or put glass in. Yeah. You know, so it comes with it. It's easy. Um, the screen's powder coated and rust resistant. The, the, the gaps in the doors are a lot smaller. So you're not pinching tails or heads or chasing geckos around the house. You know, just little things that because I've kept these animals in all these enclosures, I know the problems they have and where they're, where they're successful. And then we can create a better product out of it. It almost seems like this is just a perfect marriage between your interest of designing and building like the engineering background and then with the yeah. hobby. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's, it's fun for me. My, my, I love problem solving and I love coming up with a creative way to look at something. Um, so we have a lot of projects that are coming out in the next couple of years that are going to be pretty innovative. It's, it's stuff that exists out there already, but the way that we're doing it is going to change the way we keep animals. That's so cool. And I know I had watched the uh, little clip that Emily had put out from Snake Discovery, you taking her through the, the building. Like that just seems so fun being able to work in a room with a bunch of different animals and you get to test different things. And of course, you don't get to play in there all day, but I'm sure that's uh, a highlight of your day. It's, it's not bad. Hatching, the incubator actually sits right next to my desk so I can watch it all the time so I can see all the babies hatch and take awesome. pictures and use it for social media and stuff like that. It's just cool. Um, I've got some of my own animals down there. Um, Bill Stewart is my lab technician. He, he definitely gets to play with them a lot more than I do. And if you asked him, he, uh, we we're, I mean, he's one of my best friends. He's been one of my friends for a long time. He's like a brother to me. And uh, he'll tell you that I am the king of coming back from a show being like, Hey, there's a box showing up tomorrow. I won't be here. Figure out how to set stuff up. And he's like, what is it? And I'm like, I don't remember. I bought a bunch of geckos. Just figure them out. So, you know, so he gets to do a lot of learning on the curve, which yeah. is not always his favorite. Cause he's like, I have no idea what this is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, no, I, I wish I spent more time down there than I get to, but I do, I would say at least, you know, three to four times a week, I'm down there for a little bit or I'll get stressed out and you have a bunch of meetings. And that's kind of my, like, I'm going to go duck away and hide in the basement and, hang the lab for a bit, poke around at some animals, check on eggs, check on, you know, see if there's any eggs I can dig up because at least I can smile about that. So That's no, right. it's, it's definitely pretty awesome to have. And it's, it's pretty cool. The, 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 a lot of those animals have gone out to zoos and other organizations. So it's really cool to be able to be a part of that. Like when I listened to you talk, especially when you were chatting with Emily, like the amount of knowledge you have is crazy. So like, how, where, where do you get that from? Like, what are you reading a ton? Like, where is this information coming from? Honestly, I'll tell you, I read quite a bit, not nearly as much as I should. And Erica's going to watch this and laugh because when I say I read, I read like six pages a, a month, if that. Um, a lot of it is talking to people. Like I get the opportunity to talk to and hang out with a ton of amazing reptile breeders from all over the world. And one thing I find is when people get into the hobby, they're really excited and they're really excited to tell them what they're doing and how cool it is. I used to be like that. And then I realized I was cutting off the amount of time that I could learn from that person. So I just kind of stand there and nod and shut up because that's how you soak it in. And I'll ask a question here or there or ask for, well, what do you think about this? And then I just listen. And that's where you gain all this knowledge. And that's part of like the Herb Society is awesome because I tell people, join up and come hang out. You're just going to sponge off everyone there that's just talking and talking about Latin names and all these you look, if people start out and you start talking Latin and they're just kind of roll their eyes at you, like you're speaking another language, which I mean, Latin kind of is, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh, and I'm like, no, just sit, just sit and listen, just soak it in and just ask questions here or there, but just soak it in. That's where you learn is being around people in this community that are just as knowledgeable, you know? Well, it always blows me away because now I've obviously I've I chatted with John Courtney Smith and I chatted with Forrest Fanning and now I'm chatting with you. The three of you guys are not biologists by trade, but you could walk into any university and trick anybody probably like trick anybody into thinking you're a herpetologist or a biologist. And it's just amazing. It's uh, it's just something that I, I think about day and night. I'm always thinking about reptiles in some way or another. I mean, whether it's a new species I want to breed or like I... I have the disease worse than I think anybody I know. There's no one that's met me and hung out with me that has less reptiles than when they met me. And it's a hundred percent true. Um, uh, one of the that's people, dangerous. <laughs> right. One of, well, it's dangerous. Cause like I have salespeople will be at a show and they're like, Oh, I really think this tortoise is cute. 
And then I'll leave. I'll ask, I'll call in some favors and I'll come back with a tortoise. And I'm like, well, there you go. Now you have one. <laughs> <laughs> so I do that to Bill all the time too. He's like, uh, okay. And I'm like, yeah, it's yours. Whatever. Take it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, one of my, one of my fellow brand managers that works on the aquatic site actually t- told one of our new people that started that you shouldn't talk to me unless you get a vaccination. Yeah. For that, just for that. Not for yeah. something else. There's nothing yeah, else yeah. going on. Just, just the reptile thing. You know, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's just something I've always loved. Well, and, as you said before we started recording, you think sleep is stupid. So I think that that <laughs> clarifies most things. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I'll sleep when I die. Yeah, exactly. So I would love to see what you think of where the hobby is going to be in five or 10 years. Like, wh- what do you think? How, how is this going to evolve over time? It, you know, it's hard to say 100%. But one thing I do see and I love seeing is we're getting a little bit more into naturalistic, uh, creating natural enclosure. I see behind you, you got vivs and planted tanks. And that's something that wasn't as much a thing before. And the hobby moved towards rack systems, which have their place. And I won't bash them. I have, up until a couple weeks ago, I used a lot of racks. Um, But then I kind of got to the point where I'm like, I want to see my animals. So now I have a wall of of caging um, with, you know, nice acrylic doors. I can look at all these animals all the time and watch their behaviors and interact with them more. And I see that happening with a lot of people. Even if they have a lot of animals, they want to interact with them more. They want to provide better than just a tub with paper. Um, in some, in many instances, that's not a bad thing. It's just it depends on what you're doing. If you're a massive breeder, it's very difficult to set up four thousand naturalistic terrariums, and it doesn't make sense for the animals either, um, especially for short term. But when you're a keeper and you're really focused on breeding, um, really recreating natural environments is becoming a bigger thing, and I really love seeing that. That's where the Beyond the Glass uh, video series from Zilla came from is, you know, the first thing you do when you get a leopard gecko is fly to Afghanistan and check out their habitat so that you can better <laughs> recreate it. Right? Exactly. Nobody does that. You can't. <laughs> yeah. So we decided, me and Mike Clarkson, like, hey, let's work this out. Where I'm going to send you. I don't get to go because I got the raw end of that deal. But <laughs> he, I send him to Indonesia, to West Africa. We're talking about all these other places. Let's go find these animals. Really look at their environment. Take all the measurements, the heat, UV, Lighting, what does the dirt look like? Is there leaf litter on the ground? Are there tannins in the water? Just things that you wouldn't know unless you were standing there. And bring that back into how do we create better husbandry for these animals in captivity. Um, And I love seeing the hobby go that way, and I hope it continues to to move in a more natural direction like that. Um, But man, who knows? I I think that captive breeding is continuing to move along. Um, um, Wild-caught animals are, are lessening, but the ones that aren't are still important. Like, we don't like to admit it, but wild collection actually conserves a lot more animals than hurts. Um, and it's harder for people to put their head around that. But so there is a place for it. And we're continuing to, to grow the amount of captive species that are kept in captivity. It's, it's, it's really cool to see. Um, and a lot of those animals that we, that we saw two, ten, five, you know, five, ten years ago aren't, don't exist in the hobby anymore. They changed. It changed how you can get them. Um, so really keeping species uh, propagation in, in, in captivity is, is an important part of our hobby going forward. Yeah, I totally agree. And and kind of getting back to that sort of naturalistic side, I think, and th- that sort of goes back to what we were saying earlier about collecting the knowledge. And that's really the fun part. And learning how to take care of the animals in that natural setting is so fun. And that's what I, I totally agree. I think people are starting to shift that way. Was there anything in the Beyond the Glass series that you guys discovered that was like, kind of like, whoa, I did not know that? Um. I wouldn't say it was anything yet that we didn't really know. Um, But it was a real, for me, it was a really good opportunity for people to really understand the habitat and where they come from. And not just on the idea of, is it Sandy? Is it tropical? But there's a couple, there's an episode that where, where Mike finds orangutans and talks about palm oil farms. And there's, there's, they're doing, uh, drilling for gold in the middle of the river where people are swimming downstream, putting chemicals in like, We don't realize what the natural environment is really like. And a lot of people have this idea, this Disney idea of how beautiful habitats are from planet Earth makes everything look pristine. That's because if they showed you the trash dump that's really there, you wouldn't be that happy about it. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't be as excited about those those animals. And that's the reality is is seeing that. And there's some episodes where we show that one thing that most people don't know. And I'll I'll let the secret out on it for right now. But. The, the Beyond the Glass of season one, there's the viper over the water with a waterfall behind it. And it's that iconic image that starts the episode. That's not a waterfall. It's actually a sewer drainage pipe. 
And if you were to expand that, that picture way out, it's cropped exactly at where the garbage piles are. Wow. So you don't see that this is like a trash area full of garbage. Wow. That Mike and his team made look really cool. That's not what's really there. And you see that in part of the, the, the river in Java as they're catching water monitors and you see trash everywhere. I mean, that's, that's the reality of why what we do as hobbyists is so important. And you don't see that. You don't see how bad it really is. And that's not even the tip of the iceberg of how bad it is in some of these places. Oh, so yeah. I hope to bring some of that to light too of what the trash that we create and what we do, where does that really end up and how are we really affecting the environments around us and why captive breeding is more important than ever. Well, yeah. And that actually leads into the next thing that I was going to ask was like, what is the deep purpose of the hobby? Because it's one of those things where somebody that's outside the hobby, they might say, well, this is just destructive. You guys are, you know, keeping animals for your own selfish needs. And, and, and partly people are in some cases. And I think obviously there is a selfish side to it because we all just love the hobby. We, we love keeping animals, but there's got to be a really good deep purpose for the hobby. Do you think that mostly is centered around conservation? Uh, to me, that is a really deep and complex question that we need more hours for. Yeah. Um, but I do think that the whole point of the hobby um, and what it does is one, it is conservation, but it's not. We're not, breeding morphs isn't doing anything for conservation. No. But it is helping to get people interacting with animals that they wouldn't maybe otherwise interact with. And when that animal's in your house and you're interacting with it, you create a bond with it, you care about it. And when you care about it, you care about where it comes from. And then when you care about where it comes from, you're more willing to do more. Like, look at straws. You can't, if you can be arrested in California for handing out a straw at a drive-thru because of a video with a sea turtle with a straw in its nose. Like, granted, straws are bad, but there's a ton of crap in the ocean that's awful. Not oh, yeah. for straws. But that one video, that one moment where we all got just horrified by watching that created such an emotional response that straws are banned instantly. Like that's crazy to really think about that. And by having animals in captivity and helping create those bonds and that passion, that empathy for animals that you may not otherwise have, if as we're becoming more urban, you know, civil urban civilizations, there's not as much country, not as much forest to go hike in as there was 50 years ago. We need to find ways to create that bond with nature and reptiles are doing that in a way that nothing else can. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And it's, especially when you go down the naturalistic path, like it just gives you this like peace almost of, of creating something in your home, especially if you live in a city and it does kind of connect you a little bit with the wild, you know? Oh, absolutely. And it's funny, Erica tells me all the time, she's like, you, she, she's like, I love when you build cages, you do an incredible job, they're gorgeous. And for me, that's my favorite part. I love building out cages. And then afterwards, I'm like, all right, put some geckos in it next. I don't care what you do with it. You take care of it. I just built it. There's plants. I'll trim them. It's awesome. Next one. And yeah. I just want to build stuff. I just want to build environments because that's the cool part to me. And my son, my stepson had done the same thing. I taught him about where our peacock monitors come from. And he came to a herb society meeting in Madison where me and Bill did a talk on bioactive, uh, uh, bioactive uh, habitats. And he got all excited. He went, we went back to the house and he built a 40 breeder front opener and totally decked it out for our monitors and then made it bioactive. And he was asking me questions about where they come from and what do they like to live. And so he can create that better environment. And that was the, like the coolest freaking moment for me as a dad ever. Oh, I bet. He's burning and he just wants to create that, that environment. And he did a, he made me look like crap. Like, <laughs> I got to up my game and school him because he really did a good job. And these really secretive monitors were out basking two hours later. I'd only seen them three times in two months. Wow. And they were out shortly after he got done. That's um, awesome. Yeah. So it was really cool. And it really helped fulfill that for him that he'd done a good job and he recreated this environment because the way they're out more often, they're more interactive. We can get closer to them. And it's extremely shy and skittish species. Um, so that kind of stuff is just the cool part of what all this is. You know? it's oh, just, yeah way bigger picture there's there's an industry and there's money and there's conservation and all this stuff going on but all of that has to center around the empathy and the connection that we create with those animals in person and you can't get that from books and shows totally yeah i totally agree and and yeah that's a really cool experience with your son it, are all three of your kids uh, involved like do they like the hobby or are some of them scared or 
I am blessed with three little girls and a stepson, and my they all are they all like reptiles. We hiked. Uh, me and the two older ones were Zach's nine, Naomi's seven. Hiked Snake Road over Memorial Day in Southern Illinois. They got to see cottonmouths and all this stuff. And super respectful of it, but at the same time, we found a green, uh, uh, rough green. They all got excited and wanted to hold it and interact with it. And my my two youngest girls think it's the, their five year old twins. They think it's fantastic to steal the roaches out of the bin and then create little houses out of their Barbie stuff and then, like feed them tomatoes and like let the roaches live in their Barbie house. And then me and Erica have to go make sure like they put them back. Otherwise, they think they just stay there <laughs> and they don't. So, you know, they, but they're all, they all love animals. And, and Naomi, who's seven, the older, the older ones now is kind of, she's at a point where she's like, I don't want to care for animals, but I want to do something with animals. So she's not probably not going to keep a big collection. She's not going to keep a bunch of reptiles, but I can totally see her being a field biologist, somebody who's really involved in the conservation and, and well-being of animals without literally scooping poop every day. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but they all have some aspect of it that they like and, and that they get involved with. And, and we continue to, to, to nurture that, get them books, get them. If they want to go do something, we're on it. Let's go do something and learn more. Um, and you know, I've even, I've, I've been able to like FaceTime while I was at a show with Philippe de Vastoli and Zach's reading about gargoyle geckos. And I'm like, here's the dude whose book you're reading. And, and then, you know, have Philippe say something to Zach and then, you know, I'll keep going buddy. And then get him all excited that he's learning from the guy you know, the, I tell them all the time, I'm like, we go to, the, you know, local zoos and I know the people and we play with sloths and you get to hold like whatever you want. And like other kids don't get this. Like, you don't appreciate how cool this is. <laughs> I didn't get to do that when I was a kid. I yeah, yeah. out now and you're doing it next to me. Like, oh, whatever. It's just a, it's just a Komodo dragon. I just fed with tongs. No big deal. Like, I'm like, that, you, how is that no big deal to you? I'm, I'm, I, there's urine running down my leg. I'm way too excited. And they're just like, yeah, it's just another day, daddy. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome well I, I think that is probably one of the best parts about the hobby is is that whole scenario the hobby does better than anything like even a, a zoo is not going to give you that experience going to uh, watching a movie or watching you know planet earth it's nowhere near being able to you know build an enclosure with your hands and watch the animals interact with it as a kid that's amazing oh absolutely and, and the other part of it too is like i love zoos i go to everyone i possibly can we have a goal in our house to get a keychain from every zoo within a thousand miles. That's amazing. <laughs> but like at the same time, it's, it's a one day and then that's it. And reading books, watching shows, we all got excited about Steve Irwin and Jeff Corwin and all this stuff like that. David Attenborough, they're just gods in all of our minds. Right. But it, it only fuels you so far and then it dissipates, you know, a week, two weeks later, you're not thinking about it as much anymore. When that animal's in your house, and you're watching it every day and you're watching its body language and how it reacts to its environment and things like that. It's just, you can't describe what that feeling is. And it's so rewarding to be able to be a part of that and really understand these animals and appreciate them versus just like, Hey, there's a cool turtle in a pond. And then you walk away, you get to see it interact. How does it fast? How does it eat? How does it hunt? How do they, how do some of these lizards head bob at each other? What are they saying to each other? It's so cool. And you pick up so much knowledge just sitting and watching. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, it's, there is an immense value in it. And I mean, and there's lots of people who are involved in the hobby. And I always say this, who, who may be doing something destructive with their life and the hobby has redirected them into, into something much more positive. So th that's why I always really try to promote the hobby policing itself and, and us trying to grow the hobby because what will happen is and it's happened in lots of places where government steps in and, and cuts things off at the knees and says we can't do this and a, a lot of hobbyists get upset and, and from my point of view I think okay that's kind of the hobby's fault like we messed up somewhere somewhere along the line we didn't take responsibility and I think there's two things that you're involved in I think and Erica as well that really is the ultimate responsibility you can take and that's one the herp society and then to the rescue so i'd love to chat a little bit about the the herp society because it, so why did you start it and how did you start it so when i was in college i worked for a store called hoffer's tropic life pets it was one of the largest independent pet stores in the country it's in milwaukee wisconsin um it's been gone for a few years now and mike had passed away last year but um amazing place and i started getting teachers and stuff that would come in and want to do reptile shows so I would take some of my animals, I'd grab a couple animals from the pet shop out of the store on my way out the, the night before. I go do an educational presentation and, and I just fell in love with it. And when I got out of college and moved to Madison um, for work, I 
I realized there was no Herb Society in Wisconsin anymore. I was on a forum back when there were forums. We, we were all chatting about, oh, it'd be cool. And I'm not the kind of person that likes to talk about it unless I'm going to do it because there's just too many people with cool ideas that die out because they don't do anything. So I jumped up and said, you know what, if we're going to talk about it, I'm going to do it. So I kind of, I, with some local help, reached out to a bunch of people, got figured out the community, got involved in kind of getting the word out there and built this organization of like, I'm a reptile nerd, you're a reptile nerd, your parents are sick of hearing from you, your friends don't want to hear about it anymore, come talk with us because we're going to all nerd out together. And that was the whole point. And then on top of that, to continue getting out and educating, because that was something I become passionate about um, doing. And, and the organization just kept growing. And I think a big part of it was my passion as well as the passion of the other board members and the dedication that we had and getting other people excited. It, like it's a virus. You get people excited and everybody gets excited. And then you, you get more people involved and it just kind of kept spiraling and building. Um, and then we started other branches and it's just continued to grow and it's be, it's on a, We've won awards through, you know, uh, uh, just be, you know, stuff that we've done in the hobby. We've been able to keep, you know, uh, animal rights groups from changing laws in Wisconsin for eight years. Um, I've actually even got, I got HSUS banned from the sponsor of an, of a ban. There was a bill that was going to ban reptiles. And after I talked to him, he banned HSUS from coming into his office to talk to him until it died on the floor. Wow. And he was the sponsor. He was the one that sponsored the bill and he went against the bill and kicked them out after we got a chance to talk and really discuss what the bill did and why it was, you know, and I wouldn't have had those opportunities had I not built this organization. It's, that's what's been really awesome with it. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing is the, like, I'm sure this is the experience you had. Government officials make these calls, but they don't know. They're just trying to do what's right. They don't know. They don't have the information. So like how, like how important is it to have that society that can commute? be part of the community. Absolutely. I, I, not to like say we're the end all beat all, but I can pretty much promise that without the Herb Society being involved in the last eight years, that there would be regulations in the state that wouldn't, that would have had very little organization to get people together. That's one thing that we do is we pull the whole community together to understand, we need you to pay attention to this. We're going to lead it. We just want you to come with and, and build up enough people to make a difference. And it, it's, it's, that's what you said is something that's really important too, is a lot of people when bans and ordinances pop up, they feel attacked. They feel like they're coming to get us. They're coming to take our animals. They're coming after me. And the reality is most of the time, those people have no idea the difference between a garter snake and a painted turtle. It's not their knowledge base. It's not their forte. That's same thing for me. If you tried to make a law on NASCAR, I don't know crap other than it's a car with wheels and it goes in a circle. Like, so I'm not going to be able to add much to that. And if somebody comes over to me and tells me that like NASCAR kills babies, like it has what looks like good evidence, I'm going to have to believe them because I don't have another source for information. Exactly. And that's where we're important is coming in as that other side and that other source of information in order to educate them. And that's where you have successes with, with lawmakers is coming in and treating them like any other educational event you do in educating the public and not feeling like they're your enemy, but there's someone that you need to educate and get to understand the real facts behind what they're doing and what it's going to do to people and their families. And once they hear that and they understand it, it clicks for them, you, you win right there. It, it's, it's when you come in swinging like they're coming after you, you shut them off and you instantly become an enemy. Exactly. Yeah. You can't go in guns blazing because they're just going to put up the same wall. You know, it's, it's showing them the cool parts of the hobby and like, exactly like you said, and I'm sure having the society, I mean, I know you guys do lots of educational stuff with school and, and whatnot. You guys can show that you're a value to the community. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's what we try to do. I mean, we've had so many cool experiences with community, with, with, with lawmakers even coming to our booths and things like that. Um, and it's, it's all about just educating them and getting them to understand what, what we do, what, how, what we're doing is going to affect them um, and, and what that means to the community around them. I mean, one in every 11 households has at least one reptile. I, my house skews that really far to the other side. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, there's enough people that have those animals that care about them. And then how they feel about them is difficult for some people to understand. If you don't love reptiles like we do, it's difficult for somebody to understand who's a dog or a cat lover, why you'd like that slimy no-leg snake but it's uh, it's getting them to understand 
more about them. And a lot of that's just a lack of knowledge. It's not a hatred. It's not a pure hate for something. It's a fear over a lack of knowledge. Exactly. And the hobby has the control to, to create the knowledge and, and pass along the education. So, so that's where we come in. And so, so why, why does, does yours, your society function so well? Is it mostly just a, a virtue of the people that you have? It's, it's a couple different things. One thing that I know being there around the country, knowing all these herb societies, a lot of them are older herb societies. Um, there's some local ones near us. Actually, Minnesota and Chicago both have really long running, very well developed herb societies. The big difference and where I don't see a lot of organizations doing well is because they're looking at herp societies as the same they were back in the 90s. In the 90s, we didn't have the internet. You had to go to the library. It was, you, had to, you, sent, well, you got faxes in. Most people, for the kids listening, a fax is kind of like a printer over the telephone. Yeah. Like, they're like, what? You know? But like you had to, you got faxes or your price list from animal vendors all over the country. And it wasn't like it is now. So, they, ha- they were very academic based. They were very based in science and, and trying to get in people that way. They weren't as much talking about breeding everything because that wasn't quite happening as much as it is now. Well, now you have a different, group, a different group of people and you need to cater to them differently. Social media is, is important. If you're not going to do it, then you're going to fail. If you're not involved in um, being out there and being in the public eye often, you're not going to do well. The monthly meetings are probably the small do. Um, they're important, but they're kind of like just something we do so we can all hang out, learn from somebody cool. But it's not the big important part. The bigger important parts are, are what we do to outreach and to get out to the community and the public. And, and that's where our focus is. That's why we're one of the few, I think we might be one of the only herb societies that live streams our meetings because everybody wants people to come and they think if you live stream it, nobody will come. Our, actually, our attendance has grown since we started live streaming. Because people see how cool and fun it is and how they can interact with people and they want to be there. Yeah, you'd rather be there in person. Exactly. But at the same time, we're sending that knowledge out there permanently to the universe, to, for everybody on social media and stuff to, to see. So it's getting more value out of, that, out of that knowledge that's being spread. And at the same time, we're not hurting from it at all. We're growing. So it's, it's reacting in a way that you understand how new people think. Getting... Do I want to hear somebody breed about someone breeding ball pythons? Not really. You unplug the light, you wait two months, you plug it back in, you put them together. Not hard. You know, but granted, there's more to it. But you know what I mean? Like, I, it's not something exciting to me, but it's exciting to someone. And it's, it's about catering to all those pieces. I still bring in scientific speakers once in a while, and it's people I know that are really good at engaging and making that, that idea or study interesting. Um, and that they, it's aimed at, like, Anywhere from kids to upper, it's not, we're not going to like a a doctorate conference in herpetology where everyone's just nodding and waiting, you know, it's, it's got to be fun and interactive still, but there's still plenty of room for it. It's just too many herp societies are stuck on the, we're going to get a guy in here to talk about how we discovered a new population of the same salamander, but it's 10 miles this way. Yeah. The pattern is a little different on its back. (laughs) Exactly. And it's just not going to quite do it. You got to think outside the box. And that's something that we've been really good at doing. And I know that you also have a lot directed towards kids specifically. And I think a lot of herb societies don't do that at all. It seems yeah, like. Absolutely. Our Young Explorers program has built the herb society even more. Erica is actually the, the um, Young Explorers coordinator. And her energy, getting the, this is another point, getting the right people into the right positions is important. Her energy with these kids is awesome. The kid, our kids' meetings are bigger than our general meetings. That's amazing. Like, it's super cool. And most of the people that are general members come for the kids' meetings just because it's fun. She did a talk on, on like herps of the universe and brought in like stuff off Star Wars and out of movies and that were technically reptiles or amphibians, you know, in sci fi, and then related them back to animals on Earth. And That's just so a cool. super cool concept that was just fun and everybody loved it it was she was actually so good at it, i had to tell her later like you need to be a little bit more clear which ones are the real ones because i really think some of those kids think they can catch that yeah they're going so, out and looking for that <laughs> yeah right but like that's what it's about it, it, it's finding the right people getting them in the right position getting everybody with passion to get excited focus on a goal and drive at it and then look at adapting to the way the world is around you and if you're not going to do those things you're going to die out 
So in terms of the youth or the young explorer, like what specific, is it just sort of a monthly meeting as well with those young guys and, and what sort of things yeah, are you doing so with the kids? The, the hour before our general meeting is our young explorers meeting. And then we do the general one right after it. And what that does is it kind of allows us to have oh, the whole group can go to either one and it's not different days. It's not juggling more time. Um, but yeah, the kids, they, they all, we, they go through Erica and, or me, or, you know, maybe Bill even who's a board member will pick a topic and make a, a presentation on it. And uh, sometimes it's, you know, amphibians of the desert, you know, something totally off the wall that people don't think about, but there are species that exist like that and talk about how they live. Maybe it's just camouflage or um, she's doing one. I think she did one this last week on um, adaptations that babies have to survive after they hatch, like certain species that have really unique things that they do, not just the everyday thing, but what's a unique thing you might not have known. And then bringing that to the kids. And then at the end of it, they have a homework assignment that they have to do, which is finding something related to that and doing a little presentation. We have, I have kids from 16 down to like, there's, there's a little girl in our Milwaukee branch who is this unreal, adorable, cute little blonde girl who's got to be like four. And she does her homework with her older brother and then presents it. And it's awesome. It's, that is it's hard amazing. not to see this and just giggle and smile at her because she's super cute. But she's all about reptiles. She let one of our baby gastrophilus bite her and she thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and then Bill comes in from the lab and I'm like, you let, her, you let someone get bit? Like, and he's like, it was a, this big. And I'm like, yeah, yeah Bill. And then she's just like, look at my thumb. It bit me. Like, <laughs> it was just, you know, it, it, so it, it's, all, it's all geared at the kids. It's all, it's taking it down a little bit of a notch so that it's not really technical, but it's high enough that they have to learn more and it forces them out of their comfort zone sometimes. Um, and, then they, and then they get points for helping out with uh, events and for doing their homework and showing up. And at the end of the year, the top three people with points go in to get a scholarship. And it's just wow. like a hundred bucks cash, but it's, and we, and we always tell them, like, you can give this to your parents for driving you here every month. And then they laugh and they buy a reptile. Yeah, um, exactly. But, but, but no, that's what it's all about is, is just kind of promoting that. And that's the other part, too, is those kids are going to, well, they might not be reptile keepers and they grow up. They might not be breeders, but they might be on a board somewhere. And the law comes up. And they go, no, nah, I was part of the herb society when I was a kid. These things aren't scary. It's nothing to worry about. Next. Totally. You know? And that's going to be important. And it's that global knowledge that we push that information out of the world. And the more it spreads, the better our world becomes as keepers. And it will spread really quick just by the amount of people that you guys have. So you have three, is it three branches of the Herb Society? Yeah, so, so we, you, have, we have a branch in the Fox Valley out of Appleton. We have a branch in Milwaukee and we have a branch in Madison. And then in the next couple of years, we're looking at potentially a branch in northern Wisconsin and a branch in La Crosse. And so do each of those do their own monthly meetings or is it like a combination? Like I'm not super familiar with the geography in terms of, I've been to Madison actually, but. So we, uh, the Madison is the one that started it. Milwaukee has enough of a population and enough people that Milwaukee has their own speaker or I'll try and get speakers. If we fly a speaker in, which isn't often, maybe only once or twice a year, but I'll see if I can get speakers to do when the, the, the Milwaukee meeting is the Wednesday before the Friday of Madison. So they're two days apart. So I'll try and get people to do both of them if they can. Um, if they can't, and a lot of times they can't, we do two separate meetings. The Fox Valley um, live streams in or gets it, they all meet at a university and they, they project, put on a projector the live stream of the Madison meeting and then they can interact with us and ask questions through the live Got stream. It. Cool. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So that's really a good template for if anybody, if, if anybody wanted to start a Herp Society up like from scratch, is there any a bit of advice that you would give them? <laughs> Expect that you're A, going to do it all by yourself. It, it, you will get a board and you will get people who want to jump on. You're going to have a lot of turnover as people realize it's a ton of work and you don't get paid for it. And be passionate. Like if you are not chomping at the bit to go talk to everybody you can about reptiles, you're probably not going to last that long. You really need to have passion. You really need to have drive. And, and then you really need to run with it. And the people who don't keep pushing it and building it and get overwhelmed are the ones that just burn out. And that's where you end up with problems. So you really got to have that passion and drive. Expect it to be 40 hours a week. You're not going to get paid for tons of stress and extra work. You just have to do it because you love it. And then the other thing I would say is call up somebody like me or the other herb societies around you that are successful. And start from there. I, I'm working right now with some organizations on, on a lot of things to bring herb societies together. And part of it might include kind of like a startup packet. 
if you're going to start a herb society, here's what you need to get your 501c3. Here's what you need. Here's how you get out to people. Here's your best ways for marketing. If you want to do adoptions, don't recreate an adoption form because 75 other herb societies have an adoption form. Here's a template. Just put your name on it. You know, that kind of thing. Here's your, the people who cover carry insurance for herb societies. All the information you need to try and build a packet for people who want to start new ones in areas. And until that happens, just contact us. Contact organizations that you know of that are doing well and see how they're doing. Contact 10 different organizations. Try and learn the best from all of them. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And it would I would love to see more herb societies that are similar to what you have uh, there just because it's a perfect example of how the hobby can fix itself from the inside out. Absolutely. And it's all about evolving. I think that's one thing, especially with working in Zilla and, and, do, and designing products, I am constantly under pressure of like, I have this really cool technology that would be really cool. But I know no reptile keepers will buy it because they still, they'll, they'll be like, I could just solder some wires to a light bulb and it'll work. Like, and then there's, we're all cheap MacGyvers. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Like, and that's, and, the, and change is hard to do in the hobby. A lot of people, I've done this way for 40 years. I'm going to keep doing it this way. But understanding that we need to evolve as a community, we need to evolve as keepers, we need to evolve the technology and the things we do in order to keep these animals better. That's where it all comes in. And even with herb societies, everyone needs to let go of the past, learn from it, and continue to evolve in a way that moves our hobby forward. And if you're not going to move the hobby forward, then get behind somebody who is and follow them or get out of the way. Exactly. And it's not about stepping on the people of the past and saying they did it wrong. It's just about taking the next step forward. Like we do have to evolve. Really? It's all about building. We couldn't, Zilla couldn't exist without what Gary Bagnell did with ZooMed. Like the, it, the stuff that Gary did in the 80s and early 90s to build this hobby is, is imperative to what happened. Grant to how it is now. Granted, the technology we have now is severely past where it was then. We still use incandescent light bulbs. Thomas Edison turned on an incandescent light bulb. That's basically what we use now. Like I don't use the same phone that he had. Yeah, but exactly. we use the same major heating technology that he had when there's so many better options and, and there's so many different ways to think about it. And that's what I think is going to drive the hobby forward in general, whether it's keeping animals or herb societies or laws and things like that. It's being able to adapt and, and educate and get out there with the common goal of just lifting the hobby at anything you do at any point, any interaction you have selling an animal to someone or creating a care sheet or you know, even just setting up your own cage for your animal, you have an opportunity to always improve what you're doing. And if you're not looking for better ways to do it, then you're falling behind. Totally. Exactly. And one of the other things that you, and I think Erica mostly spearheads this, but I think you're involved in well is as well is the rescue, yep. the reptile rescue. So it, I know the rescue is fairly, it's a fairly well-functioning machine you guys have there what 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 makes it work so well because there's some some people that want to start a rescue and then they just get overwhelmed because it's just so much work and it, it can be dangerous you know you're crossing contamination and whatnot so what makes it work uh first let me tell you this is all, erica's rescue she started um like eight, eight years ago i just got put on the board because i'm dating her <laughs> so it was before that, but I got put on the board uh, just for my knowledge because we're good friends and stuff. And it's one out of all the rescues in the country. There's only a couple I'll support and hers is the gold platinum diamond standard. It is unreal what she does. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that she has a background in exotic animal care. She's a uh, certified a CBT uh, veterinary technician and she's dealt with exotics for 15 years. Um, she knows more about exotic reptile about reptile like medicine than a lot of the doctors that were, were at the clinic she worked at who were exotic vets um, she's just passionate about learning too and, and just on the medical side um and what that helps one just because when she brings in animals she understands what their needs are um and then i help with the husbandry needs of the animals so she looks at the medical i look at the husbandry and we kind of team really well together um but the other part of it if you want to start a rescue and you want to be successful be ethical, which is a big thing most people don't understand. Be a 501c3 nonprofit and be legitimate. Don't just be somebody on Craigslist asking for a bunch of animals. Um, and then understand that you need to have a lot of extra money and time because all these people think, well, I'm going to get sponsorships and people are going to help me. And that is not the case at all. 
Um, the rescue that we run that, that you know, Erica's leading is, is doing a lot of things, but really marketing out to the right people and getting sponsorships here and there happens, but you really need to run on yourself. And if you can't financially support it for the first five years, it's going to die. So you need to make sure that you as the, as the person running it can financially support it by yourself in the beginning to get it going. And at some point, if you do it ethically and you do it well, you will build up credibility. You will build up and get sponsorships and get assistance um, in certain ways, get, you know, Zillow sponsor you, things like that. But at the same time, if you don't push through that tough time and financially do it and do it right, then you're going to be like every other rescue that falls on their face. Yeah. And the rescues, the idea of them do come from a good place. Obviously, there's a lot of collateral damage in the hobby and, and trying to help that is great. But exactly, there's a lot of people out there that just go, oh, I'll just have a room full of reptiles. I'll get them for free. And then all of a sudden, they need a rescue to rescue them. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, a lot of rescues. And it, the other thing too, I can tell you is if they're not in better care at, in your under your care than they were beforehand, you're not a rescue, period. And that's something that's very difficult for people to understand too, is you can't have seven bearded dragons in a 40 breeder. You can't have 80 turtles in a pond. You know, you have to do well by the animals. And if you don't have the resources to do it, then don't take that many animals in. And you have to do better. Even the rescues need to do better. And then also the other part of it too, is be wary of the idea of uh, compassion fatigue you're going to see the worst of the worst of the hobby. You're going to see the worst cared for animals, the worst husbandry. You're also going to run into a lot of people where that's not the case. Their kid went to college and couldn't take the animal. It's healthy. It just needs a new home. But you are going to see a lot of bad stuff. And you can't let that beat you down. You have to understand that the goal, when I see that stuff, I get really frustrated and it's sickening sometimes. It's really frustrating to have to take in an animal, watch the person cry because they feel like they loved it, but they loved it in an anthropomorphized way of they thought they loved it as, as an animal, like a dog, but they didn't loving reptiles is creating the best environment you can for them and having the best husbandry. That's how you show you love them. And most people don't understand that. So you have someone who's crying that they're giving up their animal and we tell them we're going to do the best we can. And I know that the next day it's getting put down because we can't save it. And that sucks and it's painful and it tears you down for a day. But at the same time, you have to understand that that's where the value of education and getting out there and promoting better husbandry and educating people, that's where that value lies. That Seeing that's frustrating for me, but it's fuel to continue to get out there and educate people on proper husbandry. Our goal with the rescue is to not need to exist. Exactly. That's our goal. You know, and that's how it should be. How long has the rescue been in operation? I'd have to ask Erica for sure, but I believe it's eight years. Um, and I would say in that amount of time, I think she's found homes for well over 2,000 animals. Oh my goodness. That's, that's amazing. It's the only 501c3 like, uh, a licensed and insured reptile rescue in the state of Illinois. There's other people that rescue reptiles, but they are not a reptile rescue on the books. So she's U- they're USDA certified. They have inspections. We work with um, IDNR, Illinois DNR. We work with a ton of stuff. And, and we're the only ones that are licensed, insured, have all our paperwork and permits in place and are, are on the record as a reptile rescue. Yeah. So if you want to do that, that is the way to go. You have Absolutely. to go through the paperwork. Absolutely. And it's, it's a bit of a pain and you might have to hire an attorney and to do it. And it's not as horrible as it sounds. It might cost you 500 maybe $1,000 worst case. Um, but that's what's going to legitimize you too. It, even for me at Zilla, I get people all the time that work with rescues that want us to donate stuff. I'm happy to do that. In my eyes though, if you haven't done the work to become a 501c3 and to have your paperwork in order, then you're not that serious about it. And then I, I don't trust that my donation is not just fueling someone's I want 40 bearded dragons. Yeah. You know, so, and, and that's something that, you really need to be legitimate, take it seriously, treat it as a business. Don't, you know, pull some money because you had some, a bad rough month and you need some bills. You really have to treat it very seriously. And when you do that and you create a good organization and and good uh, uh, protocols, you're going to, that's where people trust you. People will start to sponsor you and help out when they can. If you just seem like a Craigslist guy pulling anything you can, you're never going to be more than that. 
Yeah, exactly. So where do these animals get, are, are they, are, do you care for them at your home or are they just all over the place from just different board members and whatnot? So it's, it's a foster based organization. Um, I want to say we have 80 something fosters throughout Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin. A lot of Herb Society members are fosters. Um, and then we have a lot of what we call foster failure, whereas they're supposed to give the animal back, but they love it and they adopt it. So yeah. that happens more often than we actually get it back. Um, but it's, it's mostly foster based. The only animals that we really take and keep in our house, we just built our garage into the, into a rescue building, um, just so we can keep them away from our own animals and kind of separate it as a business. So they're not all mixed together and it feels better for us. And then as a, as an organization makes more sense rather than mixing everything together where you, there's no defined line. Um, but anyway, uh, the animals that we keep are usually very bad shape ones, ones that need a lot of weight or large constrictors that are aggressive, things that we can handle, that we have the ability and knowledge and, and background in being able to deal with, where we wouldn't want to have a foster taking in a dwarf caiman that's psychotic. Um, that's something we take. Or if it's something that needs a medication administered multiple times a week, that's Erica's forte. We keep that animal, me and her work with it. Gotcha. And then once it's a little bit better and it's eating on its own, then it goes to a foster. Makes sense. So uh, we're almost at the end of the hour here. So I, I really appreciate everything that you've uh, told me here. What, what do you have at home? I know it's probably a giant list. You don't have to go through yeah. everything. <laughs> I actually have the least amount of animals I've had in about 10 years. Um, oh, wow. This with work and stuff, I decided a couple years ago that I had a little bit of everything because I am, have reptile ADD. I'm like, there's a gecko. I have to have it. There's a thing. Yeah. I have to have it. And then I ended up having like a pair of freaking everything <laughs> right, a rack that had like Australian geckos and like new Caledonian stuff. I'm like, I'm messing up the husbandry and nobody's perfect. And they're all like good enough. Yeah. And I didn't feel right about it. So, and I realized after I had my twins, I was like, I need more time. So I looked at my animals. I said, if everything I had was worth nothing and I could never sell it, I just had it cause I enjoyed it. What would I keep? And that's what I keep now. And what that is, is, uh, South Pacific and Australian pythons and uh, Odatria are dwarf monitors. Those are the majority. And then we, we keep some geckos and stuff too, because geckos are my just passion. I'm never going to get away from it. Um, so we have a couple of geckos too. And then Erica now loves micro geckos because I may have sort of got the ball rolling on that so I could have some geckos again. Um, <laughs> hey, these are cool. Look at these. Right? Like, yeah, look how neat this is. And she's like, it's yeah. adorable. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I bet you can have it. What? <laughs> it's crazy. I know a guy with a couple of these. This is just crazy coincidence that you yeah. happen to look at it when I knew this. Um, <laughs> no, but, and she's passionate about the animals too. So that's, that's mostly what we do is a lot of the dwarf monitors. And we also take a look at stuff that's not at, we focus a little stronger on stuff that's not commonly captive bred. So um, our big projects right now are spinulosis monitors, peacock monitors, um, Timor pythons, and then like white lip pythons. And we're trying to work more with that kind of stuff, stuff that we don't see captive bred as much. And that really, I think are beautiful and amazing animals that need more um, place in the hobby. Well, I think that's a cool mental exercise to go through if someone's looking at their collection. Like if, if nothing, if nothing had a value dollar, dollar wise, what would you passion, be passionate about? What would you want to keep? And, and I think there's a lot of people that end up getting into things that they think they see the dollar signs and, yep. and they just lose the passion for it. Exactly. And that's, what's going to keep you happy. Like I'm, I have the least amount of animals and I'm happier than I've ever been with them. Is I enjoy every one of them. I've been gnawed on this week and I'm sitting there getting bit by a snake going, Ah, you're such a goofball. <laughs> yeah, <'cause laughs> like, I love this animal, you know, and that's where I get more excited now. It, it, if, if you overwhelm yourself, it becomes a job. And I don't care how much you love your job. Jobs aren't fun. Yeah, totally. You know? So keep it a passion, keep it exciting and, and keep it with stuff that you just love. Exactly. I completely agree. And I think on that note, can you let everybody know where they can find you, Zilla, online? So Zilla, you can find at ZillaRules.com. We're on Facebook. Soon on Instagram. I know for everybody listening, like we're late to Instagram. I get it. I'm working on it. Um, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me through the Herb Size website. Uh, you can email me. You can find me on Instagram. I think Herb Tile Dad is my signature or whatever. Um, and then same thing, the rescues, Friends of Scales Reptile Rescue. You can find them on Facebook and online. Um, and then basically just Google my name and you'll find me. I'm apparently everywhere. So it's true. You're easy to find online. <laughs> yeah. That's why I always tell people when I'm making a trade or something, I'm like, dude, you won't lose me. Trust me. Yeah. You'll just be able Google to find it. me. 
Awesome. Well, Ryan, it was a pleasure chatting with you and I, I really appreciate it. I think you have an amazing amount of information. So this should be a good resource for, for people that are trying to improve the hobby. Well, thanks. I had a lot of fun. And you know what? The one thing I'll tell you is there's no point in having this much knowledge if I can't share it with people. Very good. Awesome. All right. That is the end of another episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you got a lot of value out of that episode. And Ryan, if you're listening to this, I am very grateful that you stopped by. That was a fantastic conversation. And I think it's going to be just an excellent resource for people that are trying to take that next step. So if you're somebody that's wanting to start a herpetological society or or, are, are involved in one right now, share this episode with the board members. Share it with everybody that wants to do this because As Ryan said, there's a lot of people going about herpetological societies in sort of an antiquated way. And I think this is a conversation that people need to hear. People need to know that there's other ways to do it. And these ways are incredibly successful. And as Ryan suggested, there is a million different ways that you as an individual can help improve the hobby, help keep the hobby healthy. So watch yourself over the next week. Watch yourself interact with the reptile hobby and try to find one or two ways that you think you can improve the hobby maybe it's doing a better job with your enclosures maybe it's you know making a nice instagram page and you know i you guys can think of a million different things and ryan gave a lot of ideas there it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking since i'm just one individual what change can i make but the thing is is the hobby is made up of individuals so if every individual ups their game the entire hobby is elevated to the next level The the hobby itself isn't a thing. The hobby is made up of people. So if everybody pulls on a little more responsibility and does just a little bit better job, we can seriously build some momentum and really enjoy a great, healthy hobby. All right. Thank you very much for listening. I do really appreciate it. If you want to support the show and pick up an Animals at Home t-shirt, you can go to animalsathome.ca slash shop. And every shirt that gets sold, $5, is donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy.